This is Dr. Stan here at Radio Liberty, coming to you from the hills overlooking beautiful and picturesque Monterey Bay and, and bringing you the news behind the news, the story behind the story. Hoping to convince you that reality is usually scoffed at, that illusion is usually king. But in the battle for the survival of Christian civilization, it's going to be reality and not illusion or delusion that will determine what the future will bring. And I need to remind you that the views expressed here are not necessarily those of the owners, management, staff, sponsors, or supporters of the station you're listening to. They happen to be my views. And, well, for the next hour, they're going to be the views of Dr. Dennis Cuddy. And Dr. Cuddy is certainly taught at the university level. He's been a consultant for industry. Uh, he was in the Reagan. Administration, Department of Education, and it certainly is one of the most prolific and certainly one of the finest researchers we have today. We carry all the books that he uh, that, that he has written that are in print today, and uh, certainly we have copies of all of his books, but those that are in print, they're all available from Radio Liberty by calling us at 1-800-544-8927. Dennis, how are you this afternoon? Oh, I'm hanging in there as usual. What are we going to be talking about today? Well, uh, I'm uh, going to probably do just what I did last time and say I'm going to talk about my News with Views column, and we might not even get to it again since we didn't last last time because there's a lot of things uh, that are in the uh, news. Well, I think that we are entering a very, very difficult and dangerous time. Right. Certainly this the possibility of an attack on Syria. As we've said many times, when you start a war, you never know how that war is going to end. We saw that after the Austria-Hungarian war on Serbia back in August of 1914. Everybody thought it was going to last for a few weeks at the most, and four bloody years later with Europe and rubble, why, of course, the war came to an end. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Well, uh, since you mentioned that, uh, it looks like the same scenario, but since uh, people have uh, forgotten uh, George Santayana's uh, comment about those who do not remember history and doomed to repeat it, that's uh, paraphrasing it, uh, they, the, the people today just sort of uh, go along with, because they've been conditioned and programmed to just go along with things, dumb, dumb down. Uh, they tried to blame uh, the sinking of the Maine in 1898 on the, the Spanish, and of course it wasn't. The, the explosion came from within the vessel, not some bomb attached to the outside of the vessel. Uh, same thing with the Lusitania. Uh, to, it was in 1915 to try to get us into the First World War. Uh, and once again, the explosion was from within because it was actually carrying armaments. And the Germans tried to, you know, warn people not to get on the boat, the ship. But uh, the only newspaper that printed the warning was the Des Moines Register. All the others refused to even print it. So uh, the Lusitania sunk with 126 uh, Americans on board. And they tried to make a big deal over that. At the time, the American public still had some, you know, some common sense. It didn't fall for it, but it almost worked. And so then we had to, we had to have Pearl Harbor again. You know, FDR knew about it, and Henry Stimson writes in his diary, November 25th, we're trying to see how we can maneuver Japan into firing the first shot. And so they did that. Then McNamara did the same thing with Vietnam. The Gulf of Tonkin incident never happened, but, you know, that was the excuse, and it winds up 50-plus thousand, 55,000 roughly American boys uh, died and, you know, hundreds of thousands wounded over that uh, debacle. And uh, we come on up to uh, today, and it uh, looks like, uh, you know, uh, it's deja vu all over again where you have that... Iraq situation where they said uh, correctly uh, to some extent that Saddam had uh, weapons of mass destruction. Now he didn't have the 25,000 tons that uh, Colin Powell was saying he had when he went before the UN, but he had them and they sneaked them over to Syria and uh, you know that's where they sat comfortably along with the Syrian zone uh, weapons of mass destruction. Hold that uh, thought, hold that thought. But basically, of course, uh, Saddam transferred his chemical weapons to Syria. Right. Uh, that was long before, certainly. Colin Powell went before the United Nations and lied, lied to the world, ladies and gentlemen. Colin Powell lied about it, knowing they were in Syria. 
Well, this is Dr. Stan here at Radio Liberty. Our guest this afternoon is Dr. Dennis Cuddy. And Dr. Cuddy certainly, in my estimation, is the finest researcher we have out here going into the background of all the things that are going on in the world. He writes a regular column for uh, certainly news with views, and if you don't read it, why, well, you certainly should. Uh, he's written a number of books, and if you'd like to get them, all those that are available and in print are available from my ministry, Radio Liberty, and so we carry his last two books, The Power Elite and The Secret Nazi Plan and The Power Elite and who they are and what they're doing. Anyway, Dr. Cuddy was simply beginning to talk about uh, the danger of where we are today because certainly everything suggests that we're going to have some sort of a little limited conflict with Syria. But as Chris, as we pointed out, uh, history tells us that uh, many times you start out to have a little war and it can get much larger. And when you start a war, you never really know how that war is going to end. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh, yeah, and it seems uh, seems to be the same sort of sucker scenario uh, that uh, they're they're using. Uh, where I had gotten up to just uh, before the break was uh, Colin Powell had said there was uh, twenty five thousand tons, and there wasn't, but he but he did have them. I mean, Saddam did have them, and he, they gave him uh, about, you know, I think it was in August, they said, well, we're, you know, we'll give you three months, and, you know, so he had plenty of signals, then we'll give you another month, and then another month, and then another month. So these, are the, plenty, these are the weapons of mass right. destruction that you're speaking of. Right. Right yeah, we'll, we'll give you the all this time, about three or four deadlines, and so forth. So he has plenty of time, and then one night, you know, the, the uh, satellites show these truck convoys sort of leaving rapidly across the border to Syria, and everybody says, gee, I wonder what those truck convoys must be carrying over to Syria here at the last minute, Joe. You know? Well, once you give them, you know, three or four deadlines month after month, uh, Duh, you know, he's going to get him out of the country and over to Syria. And then, of course, George Bush could have said, well, they went to Syria, but then George Bush didn't say, yes, we know they went to Syria because it wasn't part of the plan. And, I mean, he could have, he could have, you know, could have attacked Syria then. Oh, look, weapons of mass destruction, let's go after Syria. No, 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 not part of the plan. And so they wind up in uh, Syria. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just like these, uh, the, the sources that, that we have. We, we had the, uh, at, at about that time, uh, very similar to the First World War, where the newspaper was full of reports of the dirty Huns, the Germans cutting the breasts off of women. Of course, they never did. That was another reason to get us into that war. And so, come on up to the Iraq War situation, to the Gulf War. And, hold that thought, hold that thought. We'll be back here in just a moment. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and certainly Dr. Cuddy is simply talking about the fact that certainly back in 2003, Saddam Hussein transferred his weapons of mass destruction, primarily biological and chemical weapons, to Syria. Before, of course, we attacked him, we knew that the weapons had been transferred to Syria, but we wanted an excuse to go to war. Saddam was willing to step down, actually, uh, certainly for give up his position, but we didn't want that. We wanted an excuse to go to war. But, of course, did anybody ever ask? today, where is Assad getting his weapons? Now, is he is he mixing up his chemical weapons in a bathtub someplace there in the palace? Of course not. These are the uh, chemical weapons that the CIA gave to Saddam Hussein back in 1980 that he used uh, certainly on the Iranians, that he used on the Kurds, and then he transferred them to Syria. And this certainly is where most of the chemical weapons have come from. There are American chemical weapons in Syria today, but of course we never mention that. And nobody ever asked, where is Assad getting his chemical weapons? Well, they were the ones that most of them were transferred back in 2003. Isn't it amazing in America where we have freedom of the press that nobody will tell you the truth? Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh, yeah, well, we we believe in equal carnage. <laughs> so, I mean, we also gave the... the uh, Material for the Iranians to make chemical weapons, which they also used to get Saddam in Iraq. So, I mean, you know, fair is fair. You're going to give some one side chemical weapons. Well, let's give the other side some chemical materials too, so they can use the chemical weapons. And the same thing sort of plays out uh, today. Uh, you have uh, Martha Raddatz uh, on there. You know, one of the the sort of parrot. Uh, one of the I call them parrots. You know, this. this the, the parrot elite has puppets. They're the leaders, Obama, Bush, so they're the puppets. But then there are the parrots. 
Uh, the parents are people like Martha Raddatz, the, the, the news media, who just get on there and sort of parrot the, the line of the various administration or, and the power elite. And so uh, just a few minutes ago, she's, you know, wringing her hands and, oh, me, and isn't this horrible? And the uh, uh, Assad's forces have killed 1,400, you know, and get, they give specific numbers, which is supposed to make you think they really have the evidence, right? So 1,400 and then 429, and she says, children, 429, children, you see, she's real concerned about the children. Uh, never mind that uh, back during the Iraq War when they asked uh, Madeleine Albright, the Secretary of State, if it was worth the lives lost of 500,000 Iraqi children because of our embargo. And uh, Madeleine Albright said, yeah, it's worth it. So uh, I don't remember Martha Raddatz keep talking over about the 500,000 children. The children. See, but now we have to get our compassionate voice. But what the, the parrots, uh, Martha Raddatz, and the other parrots don't say, what they don't say, and uh, if, if you want to go online, if the listener you know, is skeptical about this, and you, you can be skeptical, it's good, it's good to be skeptical. But if you actually want to see and actually hear the comments of the people involved in Syria, uh, a good site, uh, it's, uh, it's usually a very good one, very reliable, is, uh, and he's been a guest on Dr. Stan's show, Waleed uh, Shubat. If you go, if you just Google this, Google this, quote, evidence, Syrian rebels used chemical weapons. Just Google that, and up will pop uh, Waleed Shubat's uh, article, his, his website, uh, I believe it's August 27th, you know, just four days ago. And on there, uh, you can actually see. I mean, he doesn't just write, you know, I heard that. He doesn't just say that. He's, he's, you can actually see. Uh, it's about 17 pages, but that's mostly comments. The first, uh, the first page will show the chemical weapon sort of uh, Arabic language. Saudi factory for chlorine and alkali. You know, here's the, here it is. Here's the the uh, chemical weapon. You can actually see the container. And then uh, when you go to the second page, you can actually see the site, you know, see the site, and you can actually click the little thing, and the, the, the video starts rolling, you can actually see it. And then when you go to the next page, it says, in this video, you know, you can click it, you can see the video, two Syrian rebels, and he says they're Muslim Brotherhood uh, types there, can be heard coordinating an attack. Now remember, this is an Assad. This is the, the virtuous rebels who we want to help, see. Uh, an attack on a, a building, and a rebel on the ground, you can actually see him, he's got the people around him and he's talking. A rebel on the ground can be heard directing someone, presumably at the source, and he's talking about they're launching, they're going to launch this rocket, and then he can be heard talking about using sarin gas next. In other words, here's the rebel, rebel. we're going to do this, and then we're going to use the sarin gas, right? And so, and then he puts the quote, uh, from uh, the UN inspector, uh, name I think is uh, Carl, yeah, Carla, uh, Carla Del Ponte, member of the UN Independent International Commission on Inquiry in Syria, and she said, well, we don't have incontrovertible proof yet, but it looks to us like the rebels seeking to oust the Syrian strongman Bashar al-Assad, they used chemical weapons. This is the UN team. They're saying that, and then she says, but we have not seen any evidence of the government using it, uh, chemical weapons. So just four days ago, just four days ago, the U.N. Uh, commission people there say, yeah, the rebels have used it, but not us up. But you don't hear, you, you don't hear Martha Raddatz saying anything about this. You know, it's, oh, the poor children. And I, and, and I don't mean to defend the side. He's an evil guy. And I'm sure there are, you know, children dead. But the point is, it's just like, you know, back with the, in the Gulf War in 1991, where you have the woman, and they bring her here before Congress, and she's a poor woman. She's, oh, I'm in Kuwait, and oh, in the hospital, I'm in the hospital, and the evil Iraqis, they came in here, and they, 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 they hurt the babies, and they threw them on the floor, and so on. Come to find out, it never happened, and they didn't identify her as the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador. And so here we go again. You know, here we go again, the Obama regime speaking as a puppet for the power elite, with their parents like Martha Raddatz and the others. I mean, I'm not single her. She's ABC. The NBC, CBS has their own parrot parroting the line. And deliberately, 
deliberately leaving out, and I want to repeat this, it's not that Waleed Chubat just says, I heard my sources. You actually see the video. You see the video of the rebels talking about, yeah, and now we're going to use our sarin gas. And they show the container. <laughs> so, but they leave this out. See, that's not, that doesn't fit the, the template that's going on here. And so here we go again. And the news media and all the people of the United States are now wringing their hands over just Assad using chemical weapons and killing the 400 children who Martha Raddatz apparently could not care less about uh, when Madeleine Albright said, well, 500,000, yeah, whatever. I mean, you know, where, where was Martha Raddatz then? Yeah. Okay, so anyway, that's, that's one of the things that is in the news today. Uh, another thing which is in the news, of course, is uh, Obamacare. A lot of these things are distractions, you know, distractions. And by the way, it could be that the British have said they're not going to participate with us because the British actually know what's going on and that the rebels, al-Qaeda types, Muslim Brotherhood types are using the chemical weapons and using it first, using them first. So maybe that's one reason, you know. Everybody just... They just say, well, gee, I wonder why. But you haven't really heard any reports as to specific reasons why the British. My guess is because, you know, some of the British Parliament have their own sources and they have actually seen the video of the rebels using the chemical weapons first. And so they said, you know, what, what are we doing? What do we get involved here for? If both sides are evil. And so another thing in the news today is uh, Obamacare. And what happens is... And this is typical, and uh, I'll mention in a minute uh, my own experience with issues like this. Uh, I, when I was in the Reagan administration, the Department of Education, I'd run into this over and over and over and over and over again. Uh, for example, uh, uh, the issue of forced busing. And I'll just touch on this briefly as a background to Obamacare. Uh, what you generally have are these ivory tower uh, leftist types who look at, uh, let's say, discrimination against uh, blacks, uh, African Americans. They say, well, this is horrible, and we got the Brown versus Board of Education decision, 1954, and we thought we had it solved, but those tricky southern racist types, uh, they say freedom of choice, and what that means is freedom of choice for everybody, including neighborhood uh, kids who are white, attending their own schools, and golly shucks, all their schools are filled up, so I'm sorry, you uh, black uh, students can't go there. Chuckle, chuckle. We've pulled, you know, a fast one on you. And so the 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 liberal, uh, you know, mental inbreeding results, because that's all they do. They talk to each other. When I was with the federal government, they just talk to each other and say how wonderful we are and we know what we're doing, and they really don't. They say, <clears throat> oh, the courts and we have found a way. We'll call it racial balance busing, and isn't this wonderful? Because all of the schools are balanced. Let's say a community is 70% white, 30% black, and all the schools will be equal. And so the tricky white racist uh, Southerners can't discriminate by putting the funds where their little white uh, darlings are. And uh, aren't we clever and so forth. And I came up there and I said, no, you got it all wrong. And they look at you like you're an idiot. Why? Because you disagree with them. And they, of course, are geniuses because they've been to Harvard or Yale and they talk to each other and telling each other how smart each other are. Uh, but I explained to them, said, okay, if your problem is that they've, uh, blacks have been discriminated against, they've got a run-down, horrible school with bad textbooks and bad facilities and so forth and so on, I asked them a really simple question. I said, first off, why do you want to keep any of those kids there? I mean, why do you want to keep, even keep 30%? They look at you like, huh? Uh, and so I developed a solution whereby all of the children, all of them could get out of a bad situation, but... If it was a good school, you know, the best, and that's what I taught uh, in the city that I'm in, they actually tried to make the, the school that was in the minority neighborhood the best school, you know, best building, best teacher, student ratio, best everything. And I said, why do you want to take 70% of these youngsters and send them to an inferior school across town where they don't want to go? What you should do is put the power of the decision in the hands of the parents themselves. And they will decide whatever is best for their child. You shouldn't be bossing them around any more than their racist uh, reactionary uh, southern the bigot was doing. You just replace them. And they look at you sort of slack-jawed, you know, these Harvard intellectual types. Like, huh, they don't understand. 
And so I had to explain it. And when we get back to the break, I'll relate that to Obamacare. All right, fine. Well, ladies and gentlemen, of course, so we have very, very real problems in America today. And I really feel as a physician that Obamacare is going to destroy the practice of medicine. It's going to begin to access to, to actually a ration access to care. And it's going to be ridiculously expensive. Dr. Cuddy, you go right ahead. Okay, so uh, the reason I was talking about my own experience in the issue of forced busing was you you invariably have these people who are at high levels of government. They just talk to themselves. Uh, they have these stupid judges like Blackman, Harry Blackman, and I quoted him in one case and said, of course, if we were discriminating in our uh, decisions regarding uh, racial balance busing, we wouldn't do it. And I, you know, I, I simply pointed out that... You know, any elementary school child could show you that you are discriminating because in order to have racial balance in every single school, you have to bust the minority population in inverse proportion to the majority. And they look at you like, hmm, you know, I mean, these are the geniuses. These are the people in the Supreme Court. These are the Harvard and Yale types who keep talking to themselves about how wonderful and intelligent they are. And they can't even do, you know, elementary school math here to just to determine that they are actually discriminating against the minority population. They're, they say they're they're trying to help. Never mind that they're they're you know uh, going against the parental wishes. Uh, and in most cases, like in Norfolk, where my solution was first tried, the the uh, the effort was led by a 45 year old uh, house painter, black house painter, and his wife, because they got it. And they, they understood. The Harvard, you know, the Harvard intellectual types, they didn't understand. Blackman on the Supreme Court, who was writing one of these busting decisions, he didn't understand. But this average, you know, average guy and his wife, 45 years old, they understood. See, the leaders are dumb, and the average person knew what the problem was, especially if it's a minority population. They know exactly what the problem is. But they can't get around it because these, these benevolent, the benevolent white intellectual is going to do what's best for them. See? Uh, while all the time, you know, looking at the southern reactionary racists and saying, you evil person, <laughs> you know, just, just flip the mirror around and you'll, you'll see yourself. So anyway, the same thing is true with Obamacare. You'll have people uh, who uh, say, well, you know, this is uh, terribly important, and we're very, very compassionate, and we've uh, gone to Harvard uh, University and medical school, and we're so wonderful, and we're so smart, and so forth, and, uh, oh, look at those poor people. They don't have health care, so let's have Obamacare, and we'll cover everybody, and isn't this wonderful? And that's when their brains sort of come to a screeching halt, just like the busing thing. You know, we, we're distributing the population, equal balance in each school, aren't we wonderful, and that's the, the problem solved. Well, not really, if you look at the consequences, whether it's busing or Obamacare. So let's look at just one avenue of Obamacare. Like Dr. Stan mentioned, there's all kinds of issues about cost and so forth, but... Let's just look, let's say, at the doctor. All right, the doctor. All right, so you have medical school, and most uh, people applying for medical school, school do not have a million dollars laying around, right? So it, it's rather costly to go to medical school today, and, you know, for the past 10, 20, or whatever years, very costly. And so often they will take out a loan, right, student loan or something, to go to medical school. Well, it's going to take them a long time to pay it back. It's not like just paying back your college student loan which you also probably have to pay back, now you have to pay back your medical school uh, student loan as well. So you've got double or triple the usual amount of a college student that you've got to pay back. And there's always sort of a deadline, you know, you need to pay this back within a certain limit or, you know, there are consequences. I mean, they're not going to haul you off to jail or anything, but there are consequences. Okay, so you've taken out this huge loan, and now you're entering the medical field. And let's just take an, an average, you know, an average fee. Well, that thought, we'll be right back. Well, this is Dr. Cuddy, and he's talking something about what happens with Medicare, what happens when you have a young man who goes to medical school, and he probably has, certainly has to take out a loan. He's taken a lot of loan to go to college. Then he's taken out a loan to go to medical school, and then he gets through his training, and he's going to go into practice. And by this time, he has a massive debt, hundreds of thousands of dollars right. in debt, and he's having to play interest on this. But he's ready to get started going into medical practice. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Okay, and then what happens? 
Well, here comes Obamacare, and it puts all kinds of restrictions, limitations on what the fees he can charge. And let's say his fee would have been $50. I mean, it could be more, it could be less for, for a visit, right? Well, Obamacare, and yeah, I'm not sure what the exact figures are, but if you, if you are decreasing uh, the amount of doctor's fees and so forth, what happens is this, this forces the doctor to make some really critical decisions. Uh, first of all, uh, he's not going to be able to pay back his student loan on time because it's going to take him like twice as long to do it. Uh, secondly, he's probably going to say this just isn't worth it, and therefore, therefore, I'm not going to take any Medicare patients. Or uh, the government comes in and says uh, you will take these Medicare patients, in which case he may have second thoughts about the profession that he's gotten into. Uh, secondly, if you're going to tremendously increase uh, the number, if it's a, quote, forced operation, because a lot of doctors even today do not take Medicare patients, uh, what, they, uh, what they'll do is they'll have to increase uh, their staff. Well, ordinarily a doctor who's been uh, forced to lower his fee, and he uh, is already in a bind, and he's already thinking thinking about reducing his staff when here comes the government if it says you will take the Medicare patient, not only is he now not going to be able to decrease his staff, he's going to be forced to increase his staff, which puts him basically in a position of going out of business. You know, so that's it. I mean, that's the that's the end of private practice and of medicine. Now everybody becomes like the Soviet Union, where, yeah, you're going to become a doctor, whether you like it or not. Yeah, here's the fee you're going to charge, and it's going to be practically nothing. And, yeah, there's going to be death panels, and, yeah, 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 and all that sort of horrible things. But that's the, that's the consequence. That's the consequence of these noble intentions that just come along and say, well, you know, there's a lot of poor people who don't have uh, insurance, so we're going to make sure they do, and aren't we wonderful? You know, that's, that's the way these people look at this. And the uh, same thing with, uh, let's say, uh, immigration, illegal immigration, which is another uh, hot topic today. You have the uh, the Chuck Schumers of the world, Senator Schumer and others just like him, and they look at things, and, oh, look at the poor uh, illegal immigrant, and, and there they are, and they're working real hard, and they got their little their children with them, and some have come up as anchor babies, you know, let's go up, we'll have a baby, and so on, so on. And, oh, we have to do something for these poor people, let's... You know, let's give them sort of a path to citizenship, which is like amnesty, right? Another amnesty. We had an amnesty back in the 80s, which was supposed to be 98, which was supposed to be the final amnesty, but it never is. And so now you have a new amnesty, and aren't we wonderful? And they pat each other on the back and say, aren't we compassionate? Okay, let's go down that road. All right, you're in uh, Arizona or New Mexico. You're on the border. And what's happened recently with all these rumors about, yeah, it looks like we might have to have this amnesty sort of path. They call it a path to citizenship. It's amnesty. It's amnesty. They call it a path to citizenship. What's happened? Do they tell you? Does the news tell you? Does Chuck Schumer tell you? No, he doesn't tell you. Well, here's what happens. Here's one of the consequences once you get by that simple-minded, compassionate notion that these people have. And the point I'm making is not that you shouldn't be compassionate, but there are consequences. There are consequences which these dummies don't even consider, whether it's busing or, you know, Obamacare or uh, illegal immigration. I've already mentioned one uh, aspect is, if there are, let's say, most of them coming from, let's say, Mexico, all right, and they got a terrible problem with corruption and crime and so forth. So they already do not have a respect for the law in Mexico. So here we are encouraging people to come up here which are already having problems with whether one should obey the law or not. And so the question Americans would ask is, okay, if we're supposed to overlook this Chuck Schumer, then what law can we break? And, and Chuck Schumer would probably you'd go into the slack jawed with you, whoa, what do you mean? Well, you know, it's equal justice under law. You do believe in that, don't you, Senator Schumer? Well, uh, yeah. Okay, so if they, if we're supposed to ignore them breaking this law, what law can we break? And he'll do, blah, blah, blah. All right, but let's go further down that road. What happens is there's been a tremendous, I mean, tremendous increase in children. Children by themselves coming across the border. And we'll pick up on what that means after the break. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, the problem is, of course, this is all part of this whole idea of bringing about a multicultural, multilingual society. Why do you think it is when you go onto the telephone with a major corporation, they say, do you want the message in English or Spanish? And they, basically, they're trying to get you used to this idea of a multilingual society because the big corporations are all in on it. It's a conspiracy to bring about a one-world government and to unite all nations together. Well, Dennis, you go right ahead. Okay. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> uh, what I was talking about was the the consequences of these compassionate uh, intellectual liberals and their decision that we have to help the poor illegal immigrant. And <clears throat> there's nothing wrong with being compassionate, uh, but they they refuse for you know the obvious reason to not look at the consequences of their actions. For example, uh, recently. Ever since the uh, recent discussions about the uh, uh, path to citizenship, what you've had is a tremendous increase in the number of children coming up, not with parents, just by themselves. And you say, well, uh, what, what, uh, what do you mean? And again, you know, if, if the news media was really educating the public, you would know what I mean. But you don't because the news media has a vested interest in world, what they call world without borders and the world citizen Obama and all this sort of stuff. So what happens is the, the news filters down. It filters down to a country which has corruption in it. A lot of uh, people involved in the drug trade or a lot of corruption at the highest levels of government. So you have this massive sort of uh, underclass there. You have some people who are very well off. Remember, they're apparently trying to recreate this feudal society of old. And they've done it in one way in China. They're doing it in another way in India. They're doing it they're starting to in California and so forth. But in Mexico, you have this very elite uh, people who are very, very well off, and then you have a tremendous number of poor people. Now, it is an economic principle that uh, once the society becomes uh, somewhat affluent, I mean, not rich, but somewhat affluent, the general tendency is that the family will have fewer children. In other words, uh, in, in years past, you would find in, in feudal uh, Europe, uh, for various reasons, you know, health reasons and so forth, uh, families would often have uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten children. And the reason, if you ask them back there a thousand years or so ago, why do you have this? They say, well, life expectancy is rough, and uh, you know, the, the three or the four of the children are going to die at birth, and no one or two along the way, and so we'll wind up with five children, maybe. And we need them, you know, to help the, the parents and plow the fields and get the potatoes to give to the king and the princes and the castle over there. And hold, so they, hold that thought. Hold that thought, Dr. Cuddy. We'll be right back. Well, this is Dr. Stan. Our guest is Dr. Dennis Cuddy. And if you haven't read his books, you need to. We now carry, of course, his books, The Power Elite and The Secret Nazi Plan. And The Power Elite, and what's the rest of the title for the second one? Uh, their History and Future. Their history and their future, and basically we carry others that Dr. Cuddy's books. We recommend them to you. You need his writings to really understand what's going on today. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Okay, so uh, a thousand years ago, and then coming on up uh, till recently, I mean, you you would often have uh, families. Uh, in fact, my mother uh, was uh, one of ten children. Uh, only seven uh, lived to adulthood. And so, as of only a hundred years ago, there were various, you know, illnesses. There would be typhoid and, and other things which, uh, people would uh, suffer and, and die at a relatively early age. Uh, only in the last fifty or so years ago has life expectancy, uh, gone up dramatically. However, if you have an impoverished, uh, populace, and uh, not everybody, but a large underclass, as in Mexico, and you find, let's say, there's a family and it has, let's say, eight children, right? Eight children. Uh, what you find is if you're in poverty, if you're in poverty and you have a large number of children, uh, at some point those children who are not very, very far from the border will say to themselves, why am I eating practically nothing every day? 
uh, and uh, I'm not talking. I'm not. I'm not talking about a three-year-old. I'm talking about you know they're nine or ten or something like that, or eleven years old, and they're a member of eight uh, eight uh, children in the family, and they're eating nothing. You know, I have a bowl of rice, uh, you know, for one day, and and that's it. You know, that's all I get to eat. And now they hear about this amnesty that the the loving and compassionate Senator Chuck Schumer and his buddies are putting forth. They say, oh, amnesty. And so what they're doing. And this is just a theory. I mean, this is provable. I mean, this is actually, you can find uh, members of uh, ICE, the, the immigration service who's sort of monitoring this. They will tell you there's been a tremendous increase in the number of children by themselves who have come up here. Why? Well, if you're sitting down there and all you have is one bowl of rice a day and you're facing, you know, a, a, an unnice future and growing up and there's corruption all around you and so forth and you're not going to get any more food, you know, next week than you are now, what do you do? Well, they run away. I mean, they simply run away from home. It's not all of them. It's not like all eight just pack up and leave. But one or two at a time from each of these families, and there's lots and lots of families, will just say, well, you know, I'm not going to stay here. I'm going to run away from home. I'm going to get across that, you know, 20 miles away is the U.S. border. I'm going to get over there because if I can just get over there, Chuck Schumer is sort of granting me amnesty. And if I get amnesty as I'm a kid, then I get all the goodies. I mean, I get free schooling. I get Obamacare. Look at this. I'm going to try it. And so the poor little, you know, 10-year-old who probably doesn't speak English, he sneaks up to the border, and it's a really difficult time. I mean, it's not like you just walk across and say, hi, here I am. You have to be in constant hiding. A lot of them will die. I mean, just die from lack of food. It's not like there's, you know, uh, orchards all along the road. They're walking. They just pick apples and pears off the trees. And so a lot of them just die because they're up here. There's no support group. You know, they're they're sneaking up. They're they're not as uh, as uh, able to to gain certain uh, abilities to find some way to get food. And I mean, they're alone. It's not like they're even part of a group. They've run away by themselves. So here you are, a single ten year old girl or boy, and you're trying to make it across the border on your own. And so here you come, and if you are fortunate enough not to die from starvation or, you know, being have some disaster befall you, and you make it, and you say, ah, here I am. Now, remember, you're from Mexico. You, you're not educated. You don't know exactly where to go for anything. Uh, and if you did, you're still considered illegal, so you're sort of scared, right? So you've made it across the border, but I'm still sort of scared. Now, picture that. Picture it in your eye. And so along comes uh, some guy, and uh, he has a, uh, a worker for him named Juan. And Juan doesn't give diddly about you or anything else. Juan just wants to make a buck. And so says, so Juan uh, finds you, and they, they literally will seek these children out. So Juan finds you and says, hey, hey, uh, you girl, uh, come here. And she, you sort of reluctant. But you will walk up to Juan because, you know, he's a young guy. There's no cops around. Says, yes, yes. It's easy. And he says, hey, you want some help? Oh, yes, I want some help. And so, lo and behold, what happens to the 10-year-old girl, a boy? Guess what Juan does? Juan turns him over to his, you know, I mean, you can call him, uh, this is call him what he is, a pimp. And they put him in the prostitution. So here you are, all alone, and you don't have anything to eat. And so Juan is going to, you know, help you. And lo and behold, you're 10 years old, and you've been turned into a, a prostitute at 10 years old. Now, have you seen, you know, Martha Raddatz or ABC News get these kids and bring them up on the news or before Congress so that they can tell it here? You know, can't you just see it on the Here's a 10-year-old girl from Mexico telling Congress, well, this is what happened to, you know, the translator. Well, this is what happened to me. I was greeted by this guy named Juan who turned me over to this guy, and he turned me into a prostitute at 10 years old. And let me tell you what I did. I mean, all the gruesome details. No, no, no. Chuck Schumer doesn't talk about that. He doesn't talk about that. Neither does the news media. But this is the type of consequences that happens when these compassionate intellectuals start telling us what we all should do. As in, don't secure the borders, you know, just let's grant some amnesty here. And, uh, you know, well, anyway. So uh, those are some examples of things in the news that are really not in the news. I mean, they should be in the news, but the news media, as Dr. Sands says, keeps them from. We have freedom of the press. You're free to see that the public does not see uh, things uh, that they should know about. And this goes all the way back to Cecil Rhodes and his plan. 
because Cecil Rhodes wanted to penetrate various areas with his secret society, and uh, one of them, of course, was economics and politics, but one of them was journalism. It's very, very important to control the media, the news outlets, uh, the newspapers. And there was actually a book, I put it in my book, Secret Records Revealed, uh, about the London Times. And the book was about all that the London Times keeps from the public. Not tells the public, but keeps from the public, because that's just as important as what they tell you, what they keep from you. And that's what they're doing now, whether it's Syria, whether it's Obamacare, whether it's illegal immigration. It's, it's all the same, uh, same sort of thing. And so this, this goes on and on and on and on. And it, and it, it, it pervades our whole society. And I think uh, it's so vitally important people understand the point that Dr. Cuddy is making is the media is controlled. And basically, uh, there are six major corporations that control 90% of all the, corp- every, all the of major newspapers and magazines and publishers and television and radio. Comcast has almost... Uh, thousand radio stations and basically that's it's into every aspect of our society and the internet uh, but until you understand that they can largely control what the American people hear, read and see you can't understand much of what's going on today and I've talked to people in the media who've told me quite openly if I told the truth I would lose my job tomorrow this is how it really works and we have a wonderful book called The New Media Monopoly well worth all reading written by a left wing professor but despite the fact he's a left-wing professor, his observations are very good, only he doesn't understand who these people are or the master that they serve, those people who control the medium and then direct the course of our beliefs. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Yeah, and uh, what I've done is uh, I've given three sort of specific areas. I mentioned Syria, I mentioned Obamacare, and I mentioned illegal immigration. But it's, it's even worse than that because this attitude pervades the whole culture. And I'll go back to education uh, just for a minute to just give you an example of how this works. Uh, in the 60s, as I mentioned, John Dewey and his fellows who wanted socialism, he said we may call it liberalism, but it would be socialism. And they wanted to do it through the schools. And it goes back to the Working Men's Party and uh, Rusty's Brownson and Robert uh, Dale Owen and uh, Madame Francoise Darusmont in the first commune, New Harmony, Indiana. Then a year or two later, they formed this Working Men's Party, which was 20 years before Karl Marx, before Marx. And that was their plan. And so they wanted to get national schools and get God out of the schools. And, you know, they've been very successful at this. And uh, so by the 60s, the Deweyites had control down to the classroom level, and they went from the cognitive domain, the reading, writing, math, the basics, to the affective domain, that's feelings and social relationships, and so forth. And what they were doing is changing the culture. It's like Antonio Gramsci said, don't just attack with these bloody revolutions. No, people don't like these bloody revolutions. What we'll do is we'll change the culture. And they did it in the media. You know, they put on the lurid uh, soap operas and the James Bond movie where James Bond is always you know, fighting the bad guys, but, you know, incidentally, he's fornicating all over the place. Uh, and, you know, the, the Christian society, Christian, American Christians just sort of supposed to overlook that. See? Well, we'll overlook this gross immorality over and over and over and over again. Why? Well, because he's fighting the bad guys and it's sort of uh, an adventure, right? And it gives you an exhilaration. So we'll just, you know, never mind. Okay, so he's fornicating. Big deal. And this hero, this hero is fornicating. See, but that, that puts into, if you're a young person, you're like 17, 18 years old, and you watch this uh, glamorous life, ooh, James Bond, boy, I want to be one of those, then there's an association going on. That's a psychological principle. An association. I can be a macho super spy, and by the way, this macho super spy that I want to model myself after also fornicate. So hey, why don't I do it too? I mean, that's the way it works. So when you have uh, originally, you'd say, here's the five reasons to buy, you know, Pepsi Cola, and you say it's this, 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 this. But then when they switch to the associative psychological principle. Later on, they don't want you to think. They don't want you to, you know, analyze the five reasons to buy Pepsi over Coke or something. They just show the happy image, right? Oh, happy people drink Pepsi. Well, I'll drink Pepsi because I want to be happy too, see? You, you reduce it to that sort of simple emotional response because emotions are more easily conditioned, manipulated, and so forth. So they want to change the culture. So, uh, for example, in education, 
uh, in the 60s, you had the student liberation movement, the students' rights movement. And I remember if you if you tried to crack down on a student who had disobeyed the rules of class, oh, you're violating my creative rights. I need to be creative. How dare you discipline me? You're stifling me. And I have my rights, right? And so they go complain to their parents. And the parents complain to the principal. And the principal doesn't want to wind up in court with some sort of students' rights violation. So, so he comes and says, oh, Mr. Cuddy, you know, you really should cracked out of these students like that. They have their creative uh, juices flowing. We should, you know, just channel it. Don't stifle it. Let's just channel it, see? But don't be... All right, so what we do is we create this uh, this culture that sort of lacks. All right? Now, that's where their brains stop. Now, if they follow that rabbit down the trail, what they would find is that, okay, what happens on school buses? Now you have this little creative monster, you know, who's who says, my creativity forces me to talk in class. But gee, you know, what's wrong with talking as long as I do it quietly? I mean, he's the teacher and he said, now, let's don't talk. Pay attention. I'm giving this lesson. Oh, but you're stifling. Okay. So now he gets to talking, right? So now he's on the school bus. And the little, you know, the little rowdy starts messing around with the school bus. So what happens with that? Well, you've got a school bus driver. Now, that school bus driver really, really, really needs to concentrate on where he or she is driving that bus. However, the school bus driver is also responsible for what's going on behind him or her. In other words, the little rowdy is starting to make a fuss. So while that school bus driver is looking in the rear view mirror trying to see little Johnny back there stirring everything up and, you know, throwing something at people and yucking and aggravating people, all of a sudden... They're not watching the road as much as they should, and they have a crash. Now, you're saying, oh, well, you know, that, that really doesn't happen. Well, in the, in the place where I am right now, in the county where I am, they're saying, they're saying, we're having an unusual number of school bus crashes. Today, today and yesterday, we're having an unusual number of school bus crashes. Now, obviously, the driver isn't some idiot who loves to go off the road with a load of uh, children, right? So I bet you a dollar, you know, to a donut that what's happened is that driver was distracted by some little rowdy doing something behind him. But that's the culture. See, we recreated the culture so that, well, we really can't discipline little Johnny in the classroom. We really can't stifle his creativity. He has to express himself. So even on the school bus where he's expressing himself up the side of some, some other child's head, and the school bus driver has to, you know, watch out because they're going to get fired if they allow this, you know, a fight to go on behind them and don't stop it. So in the meantime, the school bus driver runs off the road and a bunch of kids get hurt. But you know, Dennis, what's really wrong with this whole idea is if you haven't dis- disciplined, down the line these kids are going to do things that are dishonest, they're going to end up in prison, and then they're going to get disciplined. They're going to get disciplined in the prison. Uh, and they said the same thing. We can't have God in our schools, but we can have a law of certainly God and certainly even religious services in our prisons and that's the end result of this whole thing. They know exactly what they're doing. They want to destroy the soul of America and our children go right ahead. Uh, yeah, and, and they are and they aren't uh, in prison getting disciplined. What happens is, is let's, let's go on down the road a little further. So they start acting up. They start breaking laws, uh, serious laws. They wind up uh, getting sent to jail but not immediately. We've had at least a couple of cases recently where somebody has committed murder when they were on parole and they didn't even report to the parole officer because the parole officer is too busy. We've also had many, many cases across the nation where prisons have become full and therefore, unless it's like a really, really serious offense, like, you know, your third murder or something, they just release you early. Early release. They call it early release. You know, you're in there for 50 years. Well, hey, you know, he's been in there three years. Seems to be okay. Well, let's release him. And what does the prisoner do when he gets released? He goes back and robs banks and kills some more. I mean, they do that. They go out and kill some more when they're supposed to have been in prison all along. And so what they're doing is recreating this culture into basically chaos, which is their goal. Because if you have crises and chaos... Then you can have, you know, whatever it is, you can have the Patriot Act, you can have the Homeland Security Act. Oh, look, we, you know, we've got this crisis. Well, you give up some of your freedoms in order to have security. Oh, yes, yes, two-thirds. They took a poll, two-thirds. Yeah, we'll give us some of our freedoms. Before 9-11, they wouldn't do that. After 9 yeah, let's give us some of our freedoms. So what they do is they create these crises and chaos 
And the slogan is uh, order ab chaos, meaning order out of chaos. You create a crisis, and uh, then you can reshape society. And, you know, Stalin used this, and Lenin used this. They had the, a, a phrase, disunion for the purpose of union. Disunion for the purpose of union. You have to create a, a disunity and, you know, stir things up, break things apart before you can recreate it in your own image. Now, they had this uh, principle in the National Training Labs document, Issues in Human Relations Training in the early 60s. It was part of the NEA, National Education Association. And then there they said how we would unfreeze values and then change them and then refreeze the values. I mean, they were very blatant about it. So they're going to take the old traditional values, they're going to unfreeze them from the students. They were going to change them to their humanistic values, you know, student autonomy. And then they were going to refreeze them into this new uh, situation ethics. I mean, they say it. And we, you know, for 60 years, we just cause, sort of slack jar our way along. And the, the people in charge of the country, even the preachers and pastors, for 60 years, they haven't said, hey, hey, once you kicked God out, who's the new moral authority for teaching Johnny what's right and wrong? Because we're teaching them the Bible at home, but you're saying they can't look to God as the final moral authority. For 60 years, all these religious leaders have been just letting this thing happen. I share your concern that basically America is in a death spiral at the present time. Right. We've lost the foundation, the religious foundation, the Christian foundation of what's made America the greatest nation in the world. America was a Christian nation. America is not a Christian nation today. Our guest, Dr. Dennis Cuddy, will be back in a moment. Well, Dr. Cuddy, we've got three minutes for you to wrap up the program. Well, uh, like I said, I was going to, uh, once again, get, get into my column on the, the final phase of the House of Orange. I did a two-parter, and it's, uh, it's very important. Uh, and so I would just encourage everybody to please uh, look at my News with Views columns, because apparently I'm not going to get to them too much in, uh, in these, uh, these uh, talking uh, sessions that we have on Friday night. But I would encourage you uh, to look at those columns that I put. Uh, for some reason, I don't know why, but I'll have somebody call me up and say, Hey, Dennis, did you see such and such? And I say, Well, did you read my column or my book? And they'll say, Well, uh, no, I guess I missed that. And so I would encourage you to look at the column. Uh, the, I've had a series after the House of Orange. Uh, one of them is titled David Rockefeller and America's, quote, Best Interests, which is an explanation of his quote from his book, Memoirs, where he said he was part of this secret cabal conspiring against America's best interests. And I would also remind you, uh, in this current Syrian situation, this, this way may be what Dr. Stan has warned about, this uh, coming war that begins over something like Syria and Iran. I would encourage you to look at uh, evidence, quote, evidence Syrian rebels use chemical weapons. Just Google that, and up will come Walid uh, Shubat. Not only his column. It's not just that he says, I have a source. He actually lets you see the video of the rebels talking about their use of sarin gas. And the media just is not telling you that, and you need to know it before we go down this road again, leading to disaster once more. I certainly agree with you, and I think we are on that road to disaster. God bless you, Dennis. Thanks very much, and we will talk to you next week at the same time. Thanks for having me. Give my best to Peggy. Bye-bye. Okay.